as we continue our series to the book of Psalms. Today we continue to look at probably one of the most popular Psalms in the whole book of Psalms. Uh, it's the go-to Psalm for every pastor and theologian who wants to prove that God reveals himself in nature. Um, uh, the, the Psalm basically declares that through nature, through the heavens, through the skies, through all the earth, God declares himself. He reveals himself. And this psalm is a great comfort to many through the years. Uh, it's this idea that we can go and look at what the world has shown us and we can perceive something of God. Uh, in a sense, God through nature discloses himself. This is a great encouragement to any who would think about it. You, know, you will often hear people uh, looking at a sunset and saying, Look at the wonder of God and the beauty that he puts in his creation. God, in a sense, God is seen in what he makes. The thing that we need to understand today is that the truth of God is painted upon his creation. In other words, God is communicating something of himself in what he is creating. The question we're going to have to answer today is what is he communicating? And this is what we'll be looking at today as we read through the 19th Psalm. And so we'll read together today, Psalm chapter 19. To the choir master, a Psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pour forth speech, night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the ends of the heaven, and its circus to the ends of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commands of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true. And the right and righteous altogether more to be desired than they are than gold even much fine gold sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb moreover by them is your servant warned in keeping them there is great reward who can discern his errors declare me innocent from hidden faults keep back your servant also from pres presumptuous sins let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgressions. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. May the Lord bless the reading of his word today. So this psalm tells us one powerful truth in two ways. The powerful truth is that God is revealing himself. And according to the psalm, the two ways this is done is through creation, firstly, and secondly, through the law of God. Now, this is an interesting idea, that this idea that God reveals himself. Essentially, this communicates the reality that God needs to be revealed. He is hidden from human perception without a testimony of himself. Now, we ask the question, why? Well, God is not explainable or nor understandable in normal spheres. Essentially, and to use theological terms, he is supra empirical, meaning beyond capacity for us to, or the means of us of understanding. And he is super cognizable. In other words, he is beyond actually us understanding him. And this makes perfect sense. As if God was understandable and explainable, he would cease to be God. To use a famous C.S. Lewis quote, we relate to God not as one person relates to the person upstairs. Rather, we relate to God as Hamlet relates to Shakespeare, as a character relates to an author. 
if the author does not reveal himself to the character, there is no means for the character to understand or even perceive the author. But God, the author of creation, has chosen to reveal himself. He longs to be perceived. And God longs to be known. And so in this, he's revealed himself. He's revealed himself in creation. He's revealed himself in his word. And ultimately, he's revealed himself through his son, Jesus Christ. And we're going to look at these aspects of God's self-revelation today, starting with our first point, the evidence of nature. This psalm begins with the idea that God reveals himself in the created order. The heavens and the skies and all the earth, according to the psalm, reveal God. Now, let's play devil's advocate today. Why, if creation is declaring God, is there such a divergent view, not only of God in the world, but by science's understanding of creation and God? And in a sense, why is there so much of science, that even a denial of God? Surely, if creation is speaking of God, the theologian and the scientist would be on the same page. But the very opposite, in a sense, seems to be true or seems to be the reality today. In fact, we seem to have a growing gap and animosity between these two fields of study, between science and theology. And the question is, why? Well, since the 17th century, philosophers such as Gotthold Lessing and Immanuel Kant, um, they brought in this idea of a disconnect between God and science, between the noble world and the unknowable world, the unknowable world being God and the noble world being that which belongs to science. And unfortunately, theology accepted that. It's been increasingly re relegated to the unexplainable. Famous theologian and martyr of the German Confessing Church, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, stated that God will not be content being relegated to the unknowable, to the fringes of science. In a sense, God is the God of creation, therefore he is known in it. But science seems to disagree here. At least the modern idea of science seems to disagree here. Science declares that it has all the answers and it leaves the unanswerable and the private that the theologian can have. So let's ask, what is going on here? Has science, in a sense, killed God, as Friedrich Nietzsche put it? Well, the, the obvious answer is no. However, man has decided to ignore the testimony of God in nature. C.S. Lewis speaks about this in his novel, That Hideous Strength, in which he talks about scientism, which is a belief that science will and has all the answers to all the problems of man. In the novel, a group of scientists uh, create a, an organization called NICE, the National Institute of Coordinated Experiments who fundamentally believe that they, left to understand the world scientifically, will ensure that man will bring utopia, that they, in a sense, scientists, will bring the utopia of man. They believe that they have all the answers, and if they can just be unfettered from conscience and all the rules, that they, the science that they will, are pushing will be able to solve all of man's problems. Now, there have been many real-world examples of this, and, and C.S. Lewis is commenting on these real-world examples. In fact, the book was written as C.S. Lewis's comment or commentary on what he perceived was happening in the world at that particular time. One example of this is the Soviet Union, who believed that in scientific socialism would answer all the world's problems. They knew that the world was material and that if we just fix the economic problems of man, scientifically, we will fix man's problems. Unfortunately, 100 million people died as a price to pay for this science. Another example is scientific race theory of eugenics, which the Nazis used to justify the killings of millions of Jews and were used with horrific examples throughout the 20th century through experiments and the abuse of mankind in the advancement of science. Today, we have a new scientism, which says that the real human is defined how you feel inside. Humanity and the way we perceive ourselves is really internal. Biology doesn't matter. All that matters is how you feel inside. We'll see what the price of this science is in the years to come. What I'm trying to say or trying to show you is that science is often not bound by its own understanding of science and by its own philosophy. In fact, it tends to creep into the theological sphere. 
It goes beyond itself to prove that which cannot be proven. Now, I make this point because although the heavens declare God, what I'm trying to show you is that it's impos- it's, it, it is possible for man to ignore that testimony. The question is why? And this will be answered in the second point, which is the evidence of law. The psalmist, after wondering in the, the creation and how God has revealed himself in creation, just awe, in, in awe of it, states that God is not content with this. God reveals himself more to human beings, this time through words, through standards, and through laws. From verse 7 to 10, he reflects on the wonder of the revelation of God in his law and in his words, simply put, in the scriptures. Now, let's go back to our question of why is, it, why is it possible for man to ignore the testimony of God in nature? The answer is given to us in the law. See, nature declares the glory of God, his greatness. The law declares the perfection of God. And it's here that the testimony of that which is declared by God to us becomes difficult for us to accept as human beings. I'll illustrate it this way. Have you ever been falsely accused of something? Let me ask, what is the instinctive and instant response? It's to defend yourself, right? To prove your innocence. And that seems right and just. But what's interesting is we have that exact same instinct and response even when we're caught out when we're doing something wrong, don't we? When we're caught doing wrong and are confronted by this wrongness, what is natural to us? What what comes quicker? To come clean and accept the humiliation of being wrong or to double down and lie and try and prove our innocence anyway? Well, the obvious answer is we cover up, right? We hate being exposed, especially if we've been exposed in a bad light, in a negative light. Now, the testimony of God, both in nature and God's law, exposes what reality to us, church? Does it expose that we're in line with God or does it expose that we are outside the will of God. So, in a sense, no one comes to the testimony of God, to the evidence of God, with a clean slate or no axe to grind. We all come with this need to defend ourselves, to self-justify. And here comes the crisis of the evidence of God in nature and the evidence of God in Scripture. It is absolutely there, But we're not looking at the evidence objectively. We are, in fact, purposefully ignoring that which might put us in in, in a bad light. That which might prove our own guilt. And so the reality is God has revealed himself. He's revealed himself clearly. What is the declaration, though? What is the verdict? Well, this is our third point. The verdict is that we need help. Verse 12 of the psalm is one of probably the most honest declarations of any human that has ever been made. Which he says, who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Let's ask, who actually knows deeply their own sin? Who can perceive how great they have fallen from the perfection that God intended for them? To put it as David put it, who can discern how deep the rabbit hole goes of their own sinfulness? The answer is no one. This is why we make excuses. We shift blame. We ignore our own conscience. In this, we ignore the evidence of God that is staring us right in the face. The verdict is in and we refuse to hear it. So God, not being content, gives us another piece of evidence. Undeniable. Difficult to ignore. Right in our face again. This time, God gives us the evidence of his own son. In Hebrews 1 we read, In past God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets, and in many times and in many various ways. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he has made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Note how God reveals himself in his son. And this revelation declares, again, that we need help. And we need God's help. Again, we read that after he had made provision 
or sorry, after he had provided purification for sins, it says here. In another, revelation of God comes at us and it condemns us for being sinful. But it's this tense testimony of condemnation, church, that we need to stop and think. Are these testimonies full of hate and malice? Or are they filled with unending, unimaginable love? Well, the third revelation of God shows us that it's love. I think Tim Keller put it best when he wrote, When Jesus looked down from the cross, he didn't think, I'm giving myself to you because you are so attractive to me. No, he was in agony and he looked down at us, denying him, abandoning him and betraying him. And in the greatest act of love in history, he stayed. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. He loved us, not because we were lovely to him, but to make us lovely. He stayed on the cross for us, church, because we needed him to. Even when we were denying him, hating him, and betraying him, he stayed. And it is in this revelation, this final revelation, that all the others come together and make sense. The glory of the creation, church, is seen as a gift because of Christ. Just as much as the death of the Son of God is. We deserve its condemning glare that we receive because of Jesus Christ. It's all inspiring, grace-filled song. The law should slay us, but in Christ it becomes a testimony of God's love and concern for us. All I have, all I can achieve and, uh, 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 and, and get is a gift. A gift given at infinite cost of God's own Son. And the heavens declare this. The law reminds us of this. And the cross church guarantees this. I pray that you would see God's grace written in the heavens. Written in scripture. Written in the revelation of his son. I pray that this would be a comfort to you. That you would go out today and look at the heavens. And see them declare the glories of God. And not say, oh woe is me. But say, oh, how deep the love of God is for us. That you would read the laws and see its regulations and not be condemned, but see, look how Jesus loved us, fulfilling this for us. And then even as we go into the Holy Week this week, as we remember again the passion of Jesus Christ, as we remember Easter, you would look again. And see how deep the Father's love for us, that he did not even withhold his only son, but gave him, that whoever believes would not perish, but have eternal life. That is our hope. That is the glory of what God has done. And it's written everywhere. It's written in everything we do. And I pray that that would be your glory, your encouragement, your hope this week. Let's pray today. Lord, we thank you. That you have revealed yourself. You've made yourself known. And how are you known, Lord? You are known as an absolutely good God. An absolutely powerful God. A terrifyingly perfect God. Who makes a way for sinners. The justice of God will be demanded. It has to be. That's who you are. But for us who are in Christ Jesus, it already has. We live as if we have never sinned. Justified. Lord, the, the world is a gift now because of what you have done. Lord, I pray that we would not look left or right or to our own ideas or our own understandings. But Lord, we would look again of how you've revealed yourself. And we would trust in that. Glorify yourself in that for us. And Lord, I pray that we would bring you glory in the way that we live because of that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We thank you again for joining us, and I pray that you would be blessed again this week by God's grace.